Welcome you to the East Canton Church of God. Lots of activity and energy this morning. Something that we can use as a shout to praise to God. Um, as you come in, there's cards in your pew pockets. Just a place for us to connect. So you can update information, add a praise or a request. Uh, and drop them in the offering plate or in one of the boxes uh, outside of the office or here in the back. Um, so just another way for us to communicate. Um, also, we have the blessing of our, give, our giving, our tithes and our offerings, and so we have the opportunity to give on our way out, or you can do it online. Lots of ways for us to continue to praise God for all that he gives us. A few announcements. So, seniors, you have an opportunity to sign up for the Star Theater. I saw there's a good sign-up going. It's right outside in the Welcome Center downstairs, so... Uh, you need to sign up by next Sunday, so by October 20th, so make sure you get your name on the list and the number of tickets that you need. So that's for the seniors. The seniors are rocking it because they're also having a bonfire cookout, so it kind of makes me want to be a senior, right? Uh, and that's on October 19th from 4 to 9, and that's at Pam and Terry uh, Moore's house. The address and information is in your worship folder. And so uh, just a reminder, bring a dish to share and come and enjoy some good fellowship uh, around the bonfire. Um, another announcement, our young adults are headed to celebration. So this is at Malone. Uh, those young college kids, they like to celebrate late. So it's 8.30 to 9.30. Um, it's a time of worship. And uh, we're blessed because uh, Dina, raise your hand, Dina is a celebration speaker. So on the 24th, she will be speaking. Uh, so we get to go have some worship, hear Dina as speak, um, support that and enjoy that. It's written as a young adult, but all of us can go. And uh, I'm going to go. I'm her mom. <laughs> so at any rate, uh, we invite you to join us and uh, maybe go to bed a little later that night. All right. Thank you, Pastor Jenny. This is one of my favorite times. We have a baby, de we have babies dedication today. Uh, so if I can get my parents to come on up and all these kids. As they come up, um, we call this baby dedication, but actually that's a, that's a misnomer. It's not, it's not really accurate. It's not baby dedication, it's parent dedication, and it is church dedication. 
as we gather together uh, as a church, we're here to support uh, our parents and their children. What a great group right here, okay? So um, I'm going to try to get this right. We have Kayla Heath with Blakely. Say hi, Blakely. All right, uh, Winnie. Say hi, Winnie. You need to do a better job than that. And then uh, Delaney. Ah, she, they're getting it. Okay, and then here is Jackson. And Mary Alice. And their parents, again, are Kayla Heath and uh, Dylan and Kay Kelsey um, Rain, sorry. And then uh, this, the Hunters are, I'm just, I'm not doing a role. I know these guys. Uh, Brett, Brett and Miriam. Brit and Miriam. Oh, man. Don't get old. Okay, here we go. So uh, par parental, parental dedication is this, that we agree as parents that the, the, there's a target for our child, and the target is to be like Jesus. That's, the, that's what these parents are signing up for, to raise our, their children to be like Jesus with their very own faith to the one who died for them. The target isn't to get in the best schools or to have the best job or, or to be in sports or any of those things. Those are all secondary to the primary. The primary is to be like Jesus. And then for the parents, all of us parents, we are to model for our kids who Jesus is every day. And they get to model for us what childlike faith really, really is. So that's what the parents are dedicating themselves to. And then the church, what we do, we dedicate ourselves in an agreement to stand with them and to encourage them and to pray with them, to help at the church, to serve at the church for the kids, whether it be in kids' ministry or as they grow older, which will happen in a moment, in youth ministry and beyond. That's what the church gets to do. And if I, is okay, so we have over there, as they, they leave, they're going to get a bud, right, this little flower bud. And it's, it's a symbol that of the, of the sunshine and water that's required for a bud to grow so, so it is with a child to grow. The, your children, parents, need to grow through your leadership in family prayer, living out the Bible, setting godly exp, uh, examples, uh, attending church weekly, commit also to a group uh, in the church, offer instruction from scriptures, and to ask forgiveness, to model a humble heart. And if I could get your help, just no, Larry, right over here, just to hold this for me. What we're going to do is we're going to um, dedicate the children, okay? And the way we do that is by anointing. And so I anoint the, the ears so that they'll hear the words of Christ. I anoint the head so that they'll have the mind of Christ. I anoint their little hands so they will do the work of Christ and their feet to walk in the way of Christ, okay? Do the work of Christ, walk in the way of Christ. Mind of Christ, do the ears, hear the words of Christ. Okay, would you, okay, if you agree with what we just did, just put out your hands like this, okay? 
and you're, that's your sign and symbol of agreement to what, what happened here and your agreement to support these kids. So pray with me. Father in heaven, I thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for kids. Thank you for the sign of your creation, for they are precious in your sight. And I ask that you would bless these children with you, with a heavy dose of your spirit, your way, your, your angels to watch over them, but also surround them with those who love you and love them for your sake. I pray for the parents that they would be very strong as the culture presses in around them, that they would look to you for all their needs. And as they look to you, the children will look as well and grow in faith and become passionate followers of your son, Jesus. Lord, it is only in your name that we could ever pray such things. And all his people said, amen, amen. amen. Give God a praise offering, will you? Yes. And so now we have uh, some this, these buds that we talked about, and your hands are going to be full, so we're going to get these... Hey, you can hold that, sweetie. Can you hold one? Do it. Uncle will. Uncle will do it. Yeah, I don't know if these these two are sisters, so Uncle's going to be a part of that. There you go, buddy. Again, give God a praise offering. Thank you. <laughs> While they're making their way to their seats, I, I am so excited about today because today we get to study Revelation 22, and that will be the end of Revelation. Some of you are going, praise God. <laughs> I hope that's not you, okay, because it's going be, uh, to be life-changing, I think. And uh, as we start here, we recognize that as we have dedicated children, if we dedicated ourselves to their to their growth and their growth in their faith. Uh, loved ones, we are here because the Holy Spirit has called us to be here. You are not here by coincidence. It is God's providence that you are here. And so as, as we bow our heads, let us pray that the Holy Spirit would do his work in our lives, even this morning. Please bow your heads. Father in heaven, that's what our prayer is, that today lives will be changed, changed into the likeness of your son, and Lord, I pray, that, Holy Spirit, that as we, as we keep our eyes focused and fixed on the founder and perfecter of our faith, that you will change us and shape us and mold us into the likeness of the Son of God, Jesus, who died for us and lives for us still. We ask this in his name. And all his people said, Amen. Amen. Please stand and find someone close to you and greet them.
could return today. That's his promise. I don't know of any other religious leader that says, hey, I'll be back. Have you ever heard anybody say, only one, and his name is Jesus. Jesus. He will come again. He is our living hope. Hallelujah. Jesus. 
Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation. to enter into a time of communion and communion is another one of these they call it a ordinance it's a command by God that we gather together and take part in his body and his blood here have a an open communion which means that you need not be a member of this church, you simply need to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, as the elements are being passed out, uh, distributed, as you decide to take the elements, if you do, just spend a moment, your eyes closed, your head bowed, and think about maybe your baptism, or think about those that, that one thing you need to confess to the Lord, to be reconciled with him, even in the pews in which you sit. So our servers, please distribute the elements.
spend a moment and look around you? Just look around. You're in community. Communion, as we, as we take it together, marks us as a part of the community of the family of God. There's great joy in that. And I'm thankful that God did not send us to be alone, right? He sent us to be together. And that's what we're doing today. So I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as Paul gives instructions to that church and to us on what it means to take communion. I'll begin in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes let's take the cup together would you bow your heads with me once again so father in heaven we we thank you and in that community that you've brought us into, we pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In community, Lord, we pray. And we ask that you would hear our, our prayers. We begin by asking that you would allow our sins to be forgiven. Those distractions that set us apart, that, that set us off the path, that... that Keep our eyes off you, these distractions, these sins. I pray that you would forgive them. And as we ask for that, we also give you thanks. Thanks for food, drink, sustenance, transportation, shelter. The, I thank you for the freedom that we have to be in this room and to praise you openly without any, any fear or worry of any kind of retribution against us. Thank you for that. And we thank you for that which we take for granted, for family, for friends, for our health, for our, for our lives. Thank you. And we lift up to you specific people that have asked for our prayers. We think of your healing touch upon Mike Gagan, Tim Henry and Tracy Murphy, for Ray Wall, Becky Du Bois, and Catherine Flodo, for Eladio, Santiago, Cheryl Jones, and Terry Moore, for Ken Gilbertson, Adriana Stewart, and Joanne Bauer, for Steve Brooks, Brenda Johnston, and Linda Noggle, for Howard Deal, Bob and Dina Rowe, Shannon Hostetler, Ken Earhart, Debbie McHenry, Ron Vance, and Adam Turno. We thank you for the privilege you give us to serve in our community and ask that you would bless the blessings exchange as they try to meet the needs of the community. We thank you for those who work there, those who contribute, and those who are blessed in what they receive. We thank you for uh, Hannah's House 119. We ask for your wisdom upon the leaders for your um, 
care and attention to those whom they serve. We pray for our missionaries on the, on the field and far away, for Dan and Christy Kim, for Dave and Barbara Miller, and Tim and Colleen Stevenson. We thank you that we have the privilege to serve alongside Tim and Colleen in the coming weeks. Lord, we pray for this country and this election that's forthcoming. We pray for your will be, to be done because your word says that you remove kings and set up kings, that you are the one who makes government happen. It's only by your providence. So I pray that your will be done. I pray that um, we as Christians would take advantage of the privilege we have to vote and that we would vote to your glory. Today, Lord, we have the privilege of uh, wrapping up this series in Revelation. Thank you for leading us through it. Thank you for the encouragement that comes from it. And I pray, Lord, that the words of a mere man would fall to the floor, but that which is from you would penetrate our hearts, would change our lives and transform us into the likeness of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And it's in his name that we could ever pray such things. And all his people said, amen. So before I get started, um, we have pumpkin rolls downstairs. It's awesome. Sugar, fat, all kind of rolled together. You don't want to miss it. And so if you've ordered them, please uh, pick them up. They'll be downstairs. Also, in your worship folder, is if you could get that out, it's one of these. We're going to try something different this year as the, as the uh, team goes to, um, to Uganda. And we are, are, you can see one side uh, has the names of everyone going. And we're going to pray for that uh, group at the end of our service here. Um, but then uh, on one side is specific prayers. But on the other side, if you turn that over, there's the tentative schedule that we have. And so please place this where you can find it, maybe on your uh, refrigerator or your bathroom mirror or someplace. And so when you see, like on the 17th, that we have to uh, depart for Pittsburgh, we'll be traveling just over 24 hours. So pray for us. Uh, not only safety, but sanity, because it's a long, long, winding road. And then uh, when we get there, you can see the, the schedule. We have opportunities to teach, opportunities to to share the buckets of love that you're providing, to meet with your children of promise. Uh, you can see it all listed there. Please, if you would, take the time each day uh, to pray for us. I, I, I so appreciate that. A few, a few weeks ago, Sherry, my bride, went to San Antonio to visit our, uh, one of our uh, kids' families. Um, our son, Cameron, is an uh, officer of the Air Force. He had a temporary duty assignment one week. And she took that uh, time to go visit with the family uh, to help out her, uh, our daughter-in-law and the two, uh, two grandbabies. And as she would do, she gave me instructions before she left. Okay, you're laughing because you know what I'm talking about. So I have learned over time that it's, it, it really is good that I pay attention to those uh, particular requests. She had said that she wanted to make sure that the... The refrigerator had some old food in there that needed to be thrown away, but we didn't want to throw it away so it was kind of hot and it would stink up, you know, the garbage can. So just before that the just before the garbage was picked up, what do I do? You dump it, right? And so imagine her surprise when she came back and I actually did that. Because she knows how scattered I can be and distracted, right? So she knew when she opened the refrigerator, like, wow, Greg actually did what I told him. The point I'm reaching is if that is important in our human relationships in the sense that they have expectations of us and not unreasonable. I mean, that wasn't an unreasonable request at all. And that was one of many that I mostly did. Okay. <laughs> but don't you think, don't you think that if you have received Christ as your savior and he's your Lord, that he might have expectations of you. Yeah. yeah. And do you think that he might be pleased 
if we got them done or at least leaned in that direction. Yes? yes. Well, today, the question, <laughs> the question we have before us today is if Jesus has promised to come soon, and we'll get there, he has promised that, should we be prepared now for the promised hope of the future? Should we be prepared now? And if so, how can we do that? That's the question that we're going to try to answer today. Get your Bibles out and go to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, we're going to read the whole chapter. Please stand. If you're able, please stand for God's word. With that screen, we'll read. Beginning in verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light. And they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of, this prophecy, of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets. And with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. For the time is near. Let the evil doer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they might that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things to the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. And let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of, this, of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. May God bless us as we study his word. You may be seated. Uh, before we move on, I have to say that you have joined an elite group of churches. You know, I, as I understand it, when, um, when this was first written, it was delivered to the churches that are found in the first part of the, of the book, of the letter, the seven churches. And so what was typical of the time is those who could read would read for those who may or may not be able to read. And so the words of this prophecy, Revelation, was actually read aloud. And guess what? We just read aloud the whole book of Revelation. Isn't that cool? I, I find it cool. Some of you may later. I thought it was really cool. 
Very, I mean, I didn't think that would ever happen in my lifetime. Okay. So um, how can we prepare now for the promised hope of the future? So we're going to talk about five things as we, get, as we try to answer that question. One is the return, the return, and that's something we'll describe in just a moment. And the, the other four are challenges, warnings, invitations, and promises. Challenges, warnings, invitations, and promises. So let's talk about what does it mean to return. So the re- this return is to return to the original plan. God had an original plan when, when he created. And if you get your Bibles and go way back to the first two chapters of the Bible, that's his plan. His perfect will was laid out in stark relief. And then something happened in Genesis 3. Can anyone help me what that might be? The fall. Now, we're not talking about not spring, okay? We're talking about something else that means fall. It means the fall of man. Sin had come into the world. And it started, we found out who the serpent was in Revelation. The serpent is Satan. And we could, we could summarize his conversation with Eve in these four words. Did God really say? And he's been asking that question for a very, very long time. And what happened was that hit her in her faith And she took her eyes, figuratively speaking, off the one who gave the command onto the temptation that lay before her. The temptation was, of course, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this is what she thought about that in Genesis 3, verse 6. She said she thought it was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise. She reached out, took it, ate it, And gave it to her husband nearby who said, okay. And we've got this problem. And the problem resulted immediately with four things. And we call this sometimes the fall. Sometimes we call it the curse. But actually, we have to be very careful because two of the four were cursed. The serpent was cursed. The ground or creation was cursed. But man and woman... Adam and Eve were not cursed, they were punished. Eve was given the pain of childbirth. Any women here want to say amen to that? Okay, and then the Adam, representing men, would have to toil for their work. Any gardeners in here have had to toil? Amen or oh me, yes? So that has continued, but now we see in Revelation 22 that there is no longer anything accursed. Do you get that? Nothing, everything is without curse. That means that creation is not only restored, but it has been transformed into the way God wanted it to be, right? This is, a good, this is very good news. Paul talked about how, it was, how creation groaned. He said, Romans 8.20, for the creation was subjected to futility, Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Now we have a complete reversal. Does anyone, has anyone enjoyed some of the days we've had recently? Yes? That's nothing compared to what it's going to be. Creation is going to be stunning, mind-blowing. That's the creation that God always intended, but the curse came and took it away. And now it's been restored. We see in here uh, the river of the water of life, also patterning out of the river that was flowing through Eden. We also see that the river was modeled after a prophecy that was in Ezekiel 47. If you're taking notes, write down Ezekiel 47 and read about it. Water flowed from the temple. Now water flows from the city of God. All that touch the water, life abounds. The fruit for food and their leaves for healing. This has been, this prophecy has been fulfilled in this vision. The tree of life is actually a grove of trees. Because we see the trees, the tree is on both sides of the river. And it's producing fruit for sustenance, leaves for healing. Loved ones, this is a picture of the curse being taken away. And it's very, very good news. So in Revelation 22, we move on to... Uh, to challenges. And this is a challenge to be holy. 
He says in verse 7, to keep the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, how can you keep anything that you don't know? And, and I've told you, I've repented for not teaching this earlier, right? Any here, anyone here before our series was a little afraid of Revelation, right? Just me? Okay, both of you, some of you. Right, because there were so many opinions about it. You couldn't swing a stick without hitting someone with a different opinion about Revelation. But now, after going through it, we understand that it was given not only to churches way back in the day, but the church at East Kent Church of God right now. To every church that exists right now, it's been given so that we can be prepared for the day of Jesus' arrival. That's very, also, very good news. But you can't know the words, to, or you can't keep the words unless you know them. And you can't know them unless you trust the one who gave you those words, Right? We have to trust that this Bible, but certainly the book of, of Revelation, is true. And we can trust it because it's trustworthy. And then only after we know the words, trust the giver of those words, and keep them, can we obey them. That is a challenge that's been made to us. We also are challenged in two words, worship God. Say that with me. Worship God. And John we don't know if that falling down before the angel was a second time he made the mistake or was a recap of what he did in Revelation 19. But nonetheless, we have here this command to worship God and only God. That means we don't worship other material or possessions. Anything or anyone that gets in between you and God is an idol by definition. And, and God said through his son, he said this, no one can serve two masters. This is Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve what? God and mammon or money. That has tripped up more than one Christian and can trip us up if we're not careful. We also have to be mindful to worship no other source of power or success. Because God is all-powerful. And can I tell you that any success you, you, you seek can only be found in the definition that God provides it. He's the one who defines success. And when our own ambitions get in the way, we find ourselves in a place of idolatry. No other person can replace God, including ourselves as we look in the mirror, or those we love. No family members, no Politician, praise God, no one should be in between you and God. There's no other source of comfort or pleasure, no entertainment, no food, because they too can turn into idols. No other ideology or philosophy. We mustn't allow man-made philosophies to overshadow our reliance upon and trust in the God of the Bible. This includes Marxism, socialism, and, the un and any other ism that might flow from that. No other government, no other government leader can replace our worship of God. Again, we must take care not to allow even something as honorable as patriotism to overshadow our absolute allegiance to God. We are to worship God alone. And that's a reason why it's in the top 10 commandments, right? We are not only to keep the words of this prophecy and worship God, but we are also to be righteous, to be holy. That's not self-righteousness. That's not self-holiness, if that was even possible. No, it comes from God himself. When your righteousness is received from Christ, not generated on your own, then you're transformed and holy, set apart from the world and set apart for the Lord and his work in your lives. This is what it means to be holy, to be set apart for the purposes of God. And when you are righteous, again, in the Lord, and when you are holy, again, in the Lord, you get to be a saint. Can I have a hand of anyone who considers themselves as a saint? If you're a Christ follower, that hand better be up. Right? Because he, we know from the, the, the letter to the Corinth church, they were called saints. And you don't have to read very far in that book to know they didn't act the saints all the time. And it's okay to say, yeah, I, I'm trying to be, but the trying 
is this. When you receive Christ, we heard this yes or last week from a great job that, that Matt Conway did talking about being saved and talking about serving, that we are saved in order to be holy. We are saved in order to be righteous. We are saved in order to be a saint. God starts it, and he allows us to continue with him. The only way, therefore, you could be a saint and righteous and holy is to do what we just read, and that is to wash your robes. Wash your robes. What does that mean? We find out in, as we go back to Revelation 7, 14, it says this, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Now, what does that even mean? Because as we've gone through Revelation, we've seen a reference over and over again to robes. Now, I've noticed that no one wore a bathrobe here today. Okay, so what are we talking about robes? And I, I read uh, from William Hendrickson, his book, More Than Conquerors, that talks about uh, Revelation. He said this, every person carries about with him a robe. He's always weaving it. For as every thought, word, and deed enters into it, that robe is splashed, dirty, and altogether filthy. In the entire world, moreover, there is no power that can clean it. As far as this robe is concerned, all earthly detergents are useless. useless. They have no avail. They are of no avail. That robe, to, to summarize, is your character. God, however, has provided a remedy. It is he who says, blessed are those washing their robes. In other words, we have washed, we are washing, and we will wash as we put our trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. To wash your robe means to have access to the cleansing fountain of the blood of Jesus Christ. That blood not only removes all guilt... But it has also qualified for us the purifying and sanctifying spirit, and we must have access to it constantly. The one who washes his robe in the cleansing fountain receives, by God's sovereign grace, the right to come to the tree of life and may enter by means of the gates into the city. We have songs that we sing. Nothing but the... You've heard that one. And then, I have washed. It's like a march, isn't it? You know? I have washed my robes in the cleansing fountain. I am a... You have learned that one. You can't be a child of God without the blood of Jesus. You can't, have, you can't wash your robes on your own. You've got to wash it. Wash our robes in the cleansing fountain. When we sing those songs, we are declaring to anyone who bothers to listen that I cannot wash my sins away, but only the, Jesus, the blood of Jesus can. It's completely efficacious, effective, and purposeful. As we prepare for the new heaven, we are called to be holy as God invites us to be with him. Those are the challenges. Now let's look at invitations. There are, there are three, four if you count them a different way. The found in... in uh, Verse 17, it says, come. The spirit says, come. And so does the true bride. Uh, who's the bride of Christ? Pardon me? The church, right? So he's speaking of the church. The church says, come. The spirit says, come. So who creates the church? In, in Pentecost, who came and the church began? The Holy Spirit, right? Right? The Holy Spirit came. Without the Spirit, loved ones, you are not born again. In Titus 3, 4 to 6, it says this. And when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy. By the washing of, what's that word? Regeneration. That's born again. Regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ. Our Savior. If you're not born again, you're not included in the people of God. Those whose names are written in the book of life. Likewise, without the Spirit within us, we can't be a church. 
Don't you know, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple because God's spirit lives in you? You cannot be the church unless the Holy Spirit's here, right? This building is not holy in and of itself. This room, we call it a sanctuary. It's not holy, but holy things happen here. And it has been set apart for the purposes of God. You, can, you, you don't have to drive very far in this area, Northeast Ohio, even the Canton area, and see church buildings that are empty. Have you seen them? You know, I want to believe that at one point there was a vibrant, thriving church there. But when the Spirit leaves, it ceases to become a church. It ceases to be a church. The true bride, the church, looks for the return of Christ. I've told you about my Uncle Carl. He called me a few days before he died. Didn't know he was dying. He just he uh, went to church one Wednesday night, and he uh, wasn't feeling very good, so they gave him a little chair or a, a more comfortable chair to sit in. They said, okay, let's pray. He bowed his head to pray, and he never brought his head up. He prayed himself into the presence of Jesus, right? I got to tell the rest of the story. So... That was a surprise, and they, you know, pastor had to call the EMT, and they came. Yes, he's passed. So at his funeral was a woman named Blanche, and she was uh, also struggling with her health. She had an oxygen tank, and uh, they were singing some of the hymns. I'm going on. I'm going on. Ever heard that song? Some of you? Okay, so there, she's singing the song, and she stands up. My cousin was telling me about this. She stands up, and she's lifting her hand. She's going, go. Blanche, all right, you're worshiping the Lord. And after the song was over, she sat down and she also died into the presence of Jesus. So Uncle Carl, back to him, when I was talking to him just a few days before he passed, he was calling me because he had my mom's number confused and he wanted to wish her a happy birthday. And he says, Greg, I thought for sure, this is in January, I thought for sure that I was going to see Jesus in September. But I think he's coming soon. He had no idea. Two days later. But I, although I never saw this, with Uncle Carl, it was like when I'm talking to him, it's almost looking over my shoulder just to see if Jesus came around the corner. Okay, keep going. I wonder if we're missing something. I wonder if we get so wrapped up in what goes on in this earth, we miss out on what's coming in heaven. We get distracted, don't we? <laughs> we get distracted. Let those who hear the words of this prophecy say, come. Are you convinced this morning that heaven is better than here? Or do you have a few things you want to get done before Jesus comes? Even so, Lord Jesus, come. See, we are to hold loosely the things of earth. Doesn't mean that we don't value them. Doesn't mean that we don't thank God for what he has given if comes. So an ob requirement, obligation, that's not the word. A privilege of looking ahead to what Jesus has in store for us in heaven. In Colossians 3, 1 to 3, it says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. This is the mind, or should be, of the believer. He says another invitation, Let all those who are thirsty come. What does that mean, thirsty? We look in John chapter 7. I, I hinted at this a couple of Sundays ago. I'm going to read it to you. So Jesus is at the feast. There's uh, three obligatory feasts that every Jewish man is required to be in Jerusalem. And this is one of them. It's in the fall, the Feast of Booths. And at the end, the last great day, Jesus stands up and says this. He says, if anyone thirsts, Come to, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, what, what does that mean? Verse 39 helps us. 
Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus had not yet died for your sins and for mine, risen again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and ascended to the heaven to be at the right hand of God. He had not been glorified yet, but when he was, who came? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came. So the implication there is this. If we have the Spirit within us, then shouldn't we yearn or thirst for His presence? See, it's not like, okay, Holy Spirit, I got a, I got a desire for His presence. Do you ever think, oh, you know, I should be thirsty? No, you just are, right? You're just thirsty. Or you're hungry. Well, I'm kind of hungry. It's a desire that comes from within. So should it be for you and the Holy Spirit. Right? We should desire his work in our lives. But we have a problem that all have had and we continue to have, and we should pray again so that we have the ability to resist or quench the Holy Spirit. Stephen spoke to the Jews when he said, You always resist the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 7, 51. As your fathers did, so do you, and so do we. But on the new earth and the new heaven, loved ones, he's ubiquitous, a big word that simply means he's always present everywhere, as symbolized by the river, the water of life. Let the one who desires take water without a price. Remember, there's no price we can pay for that water. He's already paid for it. It's truly only by the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus. Now, what does all this invitation mean? It means this, as we prepare for that day, we are to live a life reliant on the Holy Spirit. Our desires, that is what we thirst for, are to be aligned with the desires of God. Notice I say our desires, not our requirements. This isn't about legalism. It's about welling up within us this intense desire to have the Holy Spirit run our lives. It's, in other words, desires are a get-to. Legalism is a have-to. Now, when we say, come, Lord Jesus, we're echoing what we prayed a few moments ago. Remember, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What is the rest of it? In other words, I need a slice of heaven right here on earth. I need need the holiness, the righteousness, the presence of God right here. That's what you're praying. The invitations to us now. But with the invitations come warnings. It says in here, let the evil doers still do evil. Let the filthy still, do filth, still be feel filthy. What does that mean? When we see let the, it means that there comes a point when God will allow his grace to cease. The chances run out. And Paul writes in Romans 1.28, he says it this way. And since they, the filthy, the evildoer, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased or corrupt mind to do what ought not to be done. Loved ones, the greatest wrath of God is when he gives us what we want when it's outside his perfect will. When he says, that's what you want. We see it all through the Bible. And he gives us up to our own desires. This is why we pray that prayer. Thy will be done, not my will be done. And it's a warning to us in at least two ways. One, as he gives us over to, sorry, as he gives over the righteous to ongoing righteousness and the holy to ongoing holiness, we pray that our lives will be lived out according to his perfect will. But two, we're not surprised when our unbelieving friends, family, or political leaders continue to be corrupted or debased. Can we pray for them to see the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ in the face of Jesus Christ? Yes, and we should. But remember, we cannot change them, just like we couldn't change us. God is the one that has to do it. The other warning is one we've seen before, a reminder that those that, that a reminder that there will be those outside un, not allowed to be there because their names were written, not written in the book of life. 
We've seen that warning again and again. They're already punished. They're already out of the picture. But here we have a reminder that the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers and idolaters, and everyone who lies and practices falsehood will not have the right to enter that city nor drink from the river of the water of life. And the invitations come with promises. Jesus says, surely I am coming soon. What does soon mean? I mean, did you realize that this was written nearly 2,000 years ago? I mean, have you ever wondered, God, what do you mean by soon? I think it's been a bit. It's been a minute, as they say, right? Well, there's a few ways to look at that. One is, soon is from the Lord's perspective. A day is like a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years like a day. He's God. He's outside of time, and he's outside of space. He can do whatever he wants to, and whenever he wants to. But the second part of that soon, when he says, I am coming soon, we, some believe, I should say, and I agree, that when Jesus said in Revelation 1-7, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, amen, that Jesus came on the clouds in wrath and punishment to destroy Jerusalem in 70 AD. We, that's a historical marker. Or that he came and destroyed Rome in the 400s, like in 417, something like that. Or maybe he came when the Protestants rose up against the Catholic Church, against the corruption that was found there. That Jesus can come before the end in judgment and make things right, at least for a time. But one day, the soon will take place. One day, he will come, as we have read, in judgment and in finality. But the question is, will we look for his return? Until then, the question or the, the point in your notes, Jesus calls us to live in the present with an expectation of his return. Jesus calls us to live in the present with an expectation of his return, and specifically to the church. Jesus calls us to be the church on earth as it is in heaven. He's called us to be the church on earth as it is in heaven. Today, you and I are one day closer to seeing Jesus face to face. One day closer. Do you know him? Do you know the one who died for your sins, according to the scriptures? Who was raised on the third day, also according to the scriptures? And ascended to heaven and gave us the Holy Spirit so that all who trust in him will have forgiveness, mm -hmm. salvation, and eternal life. That's the good news of Jesus Christ right there. Really, really good news. Okay, so... Let's say you're a Christ follower, and the day comes. What do you want to hear from Jesus? You've practiced that line. Well done, good and faithful servant. That comes from a parable in Matthew 25. He says this. Well, well, okay, let me back up. The parable is that Jesus is telling of a nobleman who goes to a far country and comes back as a king. Before he goes, he gives three guys, three, I think guys, uh, these investments, right? And they're supposed to go do business with them. He comes back and two of them do business with them. The third one doesn't. You can read it for yourself. But the first, the first two, they hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. And here it is. Enter into the joy of your master. Is that what you want? Well, if you want that, what are Jesus' expectations of the church? Because remember, two weeks, yeah, two weeks ago, we, we talked about heaven being a prepared place for a prepared people. So as we live our lives now, stretching toward that time that we're going to meet him face to face, do you want to be prepared for that day? As your pastor, I want each of you to have a really good day on that day so that you will hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. So what do we do? Here's a few thoughts before we close. One is 
Let's be found washing our robes. Can we do that? That is worship him alone as Christ followers. Be zealous to make sure that nothing gets in between you and God. Trust him and obey him. Trust his word that one day he will return. And every day you're, you are going, no, every day. Many days there will be from now until then that you will hear someone say, did God really say? And here's your challenge. Know your Bible so that you can go, yep, he did. Next question. Because you got to know the prophecy before you can keep it. And you're, you're getting tired of me saying this, but I don't care. I'm going to say it. That you need to know your word hand, right? Right? You need to listen to God's word. You need to read God's word. You need to study God's word. You need to memorize God's word. And then you need to meditate on God's word. Don't lose sight of that, loved ones. Know your Bibles. So when someone says to you, did God really say, you can with confidence say, yes, he did. Trust his word. Know his word. Keep the word through obedience. Obey his word. Carry it out. Especially, especially, especially in our relationships. Relationships in the home. Relationships in the workplace. Relationships in the school. Relationships in the community. In especially our relationship with God. Remember the cross. We've got two, two parts. This part and that part. Horizontal represents our relationship with God. The, the no, uh, vertical, sorry, re, re, uh, rep, represents what? Relationship with God. Now the horizontal? Relationship with others. Loved ones, you cannot have good relationship with others unless you have a good relationship with God. And carry out his commands. So one, be found washing our robes. Two, actively prepare the church for his return. How? We have a mission statement. To glorify God by loving God, loving people, making disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what God's told us to do as his church. So we need to stay on mission. We need to make sure that we give God glory and not ourselves. Our behavior shows that we seek to love God above all else, even ourselves. And we love others, especially when they're difficult. Do you have any difficult people in your life? God has called you to love even them. And remember... God has called them to love even you. And we have a vision that we will be a church following Jesus together. We will be united in faith. That's what one of our readings was this, uh, this week in Revelation, I'm sorry, Hebrews 4. The reason why other churches, and I'm not trying to compare, but these are, no, the reason why churches fail oftentimes is because they're not united in faith. We need to be united in faith to keep Jesus the center of all we do. And so, thirdly, all this to say, we need to live today as if he comes tomorrow. Keep short accounts with God. Keep your robes cleaned, washed in the fountain of the blood of Jesus. Keep short accounts with those God places in your lives. Have good relationships. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Along with all malice, be kind to one another, tender-hearted forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. In your notes, Jesus calls us to be the church on earth as it is in heaven. So over this study of Revelation, we've learned that we are to be ready. We've learned that when, not if, trial and tribulation come, God is still on his throne. And for us to be the church on, heaven, on earth as it is in heaven, God calls us to live each day preparing for the day of his return. What do, you new, what do you need to do today to prepare for that day? Please bow your heads. So Father in heaven, I, I'm so grateful for your word. Thank you that you have allowed us to go all the way through this important book, this, this capstone of, of the New Testament, of all the Bible, giving us a hope of your return. And so, Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who recognizes that there's got to be some changes made in order to prepare, be prepared for that day. I pray that they would. Holy Spirit, don't let them go. Now, if there's anyone here who 
simply needs to get back on track, I pray that they would. But for all of us, may we have a good day on that day, not for our own sake, but for yours, so that we can enter into the joy of our master. It's in our master's name that we pray, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So on my left, uh, your right is uh, an altar. I got altars on both sides. But over here, if you want to come and just pray by yourself, please come and pray. If you'd like to pray with somebody on my right, your left, uh, come here and someone will pray with you. Please stand and we'll sing. ask that you just be seated for a moment. Um, Mike Conway, come on up. Uh, all the team members come to the middle here. We just, we just ask for your prayers. And just take a few moments. Uh, we have uh, uh, Beth Gross, Charlene Moore, Matt Conway, Anitra Myers, uh, Judah Myers, Steve, um, Fran, Steve Moore, Fran Dean, and myself, eight of us. So, And so if you agree with the prayer, just like the baby dedication, put your hands out toward us. I appreciate that. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for each one of these uh, members of the congregation that are, are making the trek to Uganda coming up this week. Lord, uh, as, they, uh, as they travel, uh, please, please uh, put, put a hedge of protection around them uh, as they go through this long flight. As they travel the streets of Uganda, uh, Kampala, the busyness there, uh, again, they, they need that hedge of protection while they're driving through the, those crazy streets and uh, protect them as they uh, work, work with the, at each one of the churches, give them the words that, uh, that they need at that moment in time to spread the, the love of Jesus to each one that they encounter. Uh, give them the strength and the endurance uh, through this, uh, what can be an exhausting trip, give them the power they need through the Holy Spirit to uh, just 
follow the paths that you've laid out in front of them, Lord. Uh, be with Tim and Colleen uh, as they receive them. Uh, let, let our team be an encouragement to them as they're there as well. And, uh, and again, each one that they come encounter with, um, just, just let, let, our, let this team be a blessing. Let them leave an impression in Uganda uh, with the time that they spend there uh, in your name, Lord, uh, so that uh, whether they remember the East Canton Church of God or not, that they remember you and their lives are changed uh, through the actions. Uh, again, I, I thank you for each one of these team members and their willingness to travel. And again, keep uh, protect them, Lord. Bring them back to us um, in early November uh, so that we can hear from them and, and hear how God worked through them uh, to make that change, to make a change in Uganda, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go in his peace. Keep praying.